thing that we could do, and we thought, how do we improve, how do we learn, how do we make things better and better? So when we think about the years ahead, we cannot continue to build more power generation plants. We cannot continue to consume fossil fuels. We cannot continue to consume at the rate because of all the things that are well known around greenhouse gases and so on. So we have to think about how to use energy more efficiently. Data is a massive part of that learning system. We think also about what does it mean in this type of environment. So when we think about hospitals, we think about the fact that we have bed shortage, and it's not unique to us. There's bed shortage in almost every country in the world. Even if we had lots and lots more hospitals and more beds, there's simply not enough doctors and nurses to staff everything. So now we say, how do we care for patients in a different way? In what way does data allow us to serve people so that they do not need to come to hospital for certain chronic conditions, but instead hospitals are for acute care? So cardiovascular, diabetes, many of the things that are well known in developed markets in Singapore and around the world are also conditions which in many cases do not need an in-person visit. Now here's the example that I like to use to illustrate. It's a small company, has not yet released its product generally, but I think it's a great example. So this is a, a product called Dialog, and it's basically a scenario in which for epilepsy, it's a way of giving feedback. So this is something that a person that has epileptic conditions would wear. It gives them indications of what might be an impending seizure. It also allows them to use haptic feedback to know what type of conditions cause those so that they can better understand for the future. And it allows the system to learn so that it knows that patient better and better as they continue to use it. And it allows, obviously, that data to be aggregated to better understand the epileptic condition in general. It's also a way of alerting. So if that were to be pressed, then it alerts emergency services or a caregiver. Now, this is a way of illustrating how do we care for people outside a traditional hospital environment in a way that allows a smart nation type of living. So caring for people while they're at home and moving around in a way that's different from the traditional protocols and different structures that we might have today. So we think about energy and we think about health. We think about an obvious one here, which is moving around. So we are, like many nations around the world, congested in terms of traffic. And then we think, what does that mean? We can plan, we can make sure that we have 5% more efficiency in this part or in that part. But the bigger goal is to think about it as a completely different paradigm. So whether it's autonomous vehicles or different uses of technology, one of the things that we like is the sharing economy, of course, and all of you will be very familiar with this. So to be fair, I've given both the Uber example and the Grab Taxi example, but the whole idea is data. And when you think about it, you think about it as matching the needs of the person that needs to move and a service that's there to be provided. The thing that some people know, not everyone knows, is that it's a two-way rating system, so that you have the rating of the driver, for those that have used Uber or Grab Taxi, and you also have the rating of the passenger. So if you turn out to be a really awkward or unhelpful passenger, you might find that the number of options presented to you when you go and search is fewer cars than if you're considered to be a good passenger. So this idea of two-way data and understanding what works and understanding how to meet supply and demand is another example of why data is so important. And so we think about these issues of energy and health and transportation or mobility. And we cannot have a smart nation unless we tackle and come up with some innovative ways of using data much more. So this is the area that we'd like to work with you on during the course of today. But in order to do that, we, I'm saying we as in IDA, I squared R, all the different partners that we have across Singapore are working on some very challenging things. Now the first part of that is this idea that we have to have super connectivity or quote unquote perfect connectivity. So our aspiration is to be able to say everyone and everything is connected everywhere all the time. Now it doesn't mean that you have to be because there's still personal choice. If you say I'm out, I'm off this afternoon or count me out, that's a personal choice. But what we don't want to do is say that you cannot be connected because you're in a particular location, or you cannot be connected because you're on the MRT, or because you're in a certain area of Singapore. So what we would like to think about is from your flat, down the lift, into the MRT, 
on the train, on the platform, wherever you are, you enjoy the appropriate connectivity for the use case. So if you need a particular type of data speed or you need a particular type of cellular connection, that's what we'd like to aspire to. So our goal is, on top of that connectivity, great things can happen. We cannot care for people, in the example I just shared, if they do not have connectivity. So if we're providing outpatient cardiovascular monitoring for a patient, and he or she is on the train, or he or she is in a particular part of the island, and they are invisible to us because of the connectivity issue, that would be problematic, as you can imagine. So our first goal is, let's make sure that we have everyone and everything, everywhere, all the time, connectivity. Now, we're not there yet. We have a lot of work going on between IDA and the telcos and our different research partners, and we need small startups that have great ideas, and we need big companies that have great solutions. So this is how do we all work together. But this is what we're trying to do to make that foundation possible. Now, here's two things where we need your help. We know that this whole narrative, this whole discussion, is not possible with citizens unless we can have a great answer to these two questions. And these are the big, hairy questions that any country and any government is thinking about. We talked about it last week in London. I'm sure we're going to talk about it in Barcelona at a big upcoming event in November, and so on. But the scenario is, how do we protect the data, as in securing the information? So encryption, obviously understanding how to analyze data whilst encrypted as opposed to de-encrypting. And there's some exciting developments in that area. And how do we protect the person? So you are willing to share data as long as it's not attributed to you. So there's this whole issue of anonymity. But if you have enough time and enough skill and enough compute power, you can reconstitute de-identified information if you have enough data points. And we talked about that a little bit at dinner last night. How many data points does it take in order to know that person X is really this person? So we need to think, with your help, how do we protect the data and how do we protect the person? So we're trying to make this a working event, not a listen to each other event. And so in the breakouts, we'd really like to dig into these topics with your help. And everybody who has a point of view in any direction is a positive contributor. Because without solving these, all the things that we're talking about with health and energy and transportation and so on is much, much less achievable. OK. So here's where it comes in. We'd like to think about how do we have big companies small companies, students from universities and polytechnics, research institutes, everybody that has a role to play is a part of helping build Singapore into the world's first smart nation. We know these two trends of urban density and aging population are inevitable. They mean a lot to us, but they mean a lot to every other country in the world. And our goal is to solve real problems for Singapore but also to make sure that we can build great companies to go solve problems for other countries. So just like we like to use Hyflux as an example of solving a problem for us, but also a problem for many countries around the world, so we need to think about these issues because every other country is worried about these two issues just like we are. So how do we work with you? How do you help us challenge these ideas? How do you help us get to some real answers? How do we test fit? That's what we're trying to do in Jerome. That's what we're trying to do in other locations. Real pilots, real prototypes, real experimentation, real learning. So the goal is not to cook the perfect design and then to launch it and to prove that we were right. It's to be OK with trying something, having it not work out, learning from that experience, and rolling on to do it again. Because that's how great things are discovered. Try, fail, try, fail. And in the startup side of IDA, our investment arm, we are very much saying try and fail and learn from it and keep rolling on. Do not think that we are trying to cook something, issue a specification, get the best price, and then implement. We are trying to do something much bigger and much more important for Singapore, and we'd like to have your help. So with that in mind, remember, build SG, and let's make Singapore the world's first smart nation. Thanks. Thank you.